Father in heaven, we do thank you for this day and now the Sunday school hour. We pray that you would bless our brother Alex as he ministers to us and instructs us from your word. And we do pray, Lord, that you would be with us as well, that this would be a great time together and uh, that you would prepare our hearts to receive your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen, brother. Thank you. Well, it is good to be with you again this morning, and uh, I was asked to speak on the topic of statism this morning, the topic of statism, and uh, uh, this is a topic that is important, not only because of our current circumstances, the current climate we find ourselves in, but I hope, as you will see uh, from the scriptures, that God's people have always come into conflict with the authority claims of those who rule. Uh, not because Christians are unsubmissive or um, do fail to honor those who rule, but because there is a battle of authority that has taken place since the beginning. And in fact, we're going to look at Genesis, and we'll look at Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and 3, and we'll see that the, uh, the, the, the nature of sin, in one sense, is a struggle for authority. And the purpose of Christ was to, one of the purposes, it says in Colossians, that he was raised from the dead, that he might have preeminence, that is, the supremacy in all things. That the world through sin was disordered. That the world that was created to be ordered around the authority, the dominion of God, and that was to be reflected through his image bearers, through sin and the fall, that was distorted. Not destroyed, but radically distorted. And so authority structures are um, distorted and dysfunctional. And the claim of the unbelieving world is that they essentially are gods. So the history of the church bears this out, that this struggle is not something we only see in Scripture, but this is the experience of most people who have lived, far less Christians, um, who experience... Uh, life under the state that claims absolute and total authority over their lives. Most people who have walked this earth have lived under such rulers to various degrees of conflict and difficulty, to be sure. Uh, but that is the normal human experience. And it's only until recently that we've experienced something different than that. And I think it's, we need to, as Christians, prepare ourselves in perhaps ways that others have and we haven't to know how to live faithful lives in a world ruled by people who make claims that the scriptures say they ought not to claim. How do, how do we live in this world? Well, this has always been the world we need to know. So I'm going to hopefully walk through some texts and point out some things and at the end, uh, make some observations about how the church can respond and open it up for a time of discussion and question and answer. Um, let me read from Revelation 13. I'm going to read a couple texts off the, off the hop here. Revelation 13. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, Dr. Peter Gentry, uh, former professor at TBS, he was one of my professors, he's a great man. He recently, I believe it was Revelation 13 that he spoke from at the TBS convocation. You could find that on YouTube. It's really, really uh, an excellent exposition of this text. But I just want to read it for you. Um, and I saw beasts rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads and ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its head. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And on it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. So the beast is given power and a throne and authority. Clearly it rules. One of its heads seemed to have mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and dwelling in his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given 
it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. So whatever else is going on in this text, clearly there is an authority that rules, and it not only requires the obedience, but the worship of the peoples. And the ones whose names are written in the book of life, that is the people of God, are the only ones not to offer worship. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with a sword, with a sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. First John ends with this, with this exhortation. First John 5.21 Little children, keep yourselves from idols. The reason it's important to talk about this Um, Often when we think about these matters, political matters, we think about them in a worldly way. Maybe something like, well, maybe we should be talking about this because we don't want our children to suffer, right? Which isn't wrong. Or we don't like the way that our rights are being infringed upon. And that's an unfortunate thing. And God cares about justice and Christians should care about justice and righteousness. We should care about the rule of law and all of these things. We should care about that. But The reason this is so important and why we need to think about this in the days ahead uh, is um, this is ultimately a worship issue. This is a worship issue. For the state to claim that which belongs to God and for people to offer up to it that which belongs to God is idolatry. The temptation of the church has always been to give in to the temptation to idolatry. That is why you read 1 John, and out of nowhere, his closing exhortation, hasn't mentioned it once, is little children, don't give yourselves to idols. Because that is the temptation. To offer unto someone or something that which alone belongs to God. And therefore... John writes to the church, here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. What is the endurance that they are required to get? The endurance and faith of the saints means on the ground, them refusing to offer the worship and the obedience to the authorities that they ask. Now, obviously, this doesn't mean that you don't give any obedience to those who rule and govern. It doesn't mean that you only offer obedience to people who are Christians. Otherwise, there'd be no obedience. We're to submit to our rulers, Romans 13, and they weren't Christians. We are to honor the emperor, and he wasn't a Christian. But we are to honor them and submit to them in as much as Scripture allows and permits. Not according to what they think honor and submission looks like. You do realize Peter, who wrote that we should honor the emperor, was killed by the emperor, right? It's like this is just lost on people. When they, when they say that we need to do everything and, and everything that is asked of us in order to honor someone. Well, someone who is a dictator doesn't feel that your limits to honoring are honorable. We see this in the home too. A, a dictator in the home, a husband. The guy is just constantly disrespected. And he has all the verses in his mind about what it means to be a respectful wife. Well, Your wife could be disrespectful or you could just be requiring things of her that go beyond the respect that she is duty-bound to give you. Just because you feel disrespected doesn't mean someone is being disrespectful. Every insecure man feels disrespected by everybody. And the state, likewise, will not feel honored by Christians who refuse to give the allegiance that it demands. This has been the experience of the entire, of the, almost without exception of the, the Christian church until very recently. Um, the earliest confession of the church was Jesus Christ is Lord. That was the earliest confession of the church. That was the uniting confession of the church. And to say that Jesus is Lord is to say at the same time that Caesar is not. 
People think that the term Savior and Lord, Lord and Savior, is, a, is, a, is just a biblical thing. It's something that Christians made up, but it wasn't. It was a phrase that was tied to Caesar. Caesar was Savior and Lord. This is on the coins. Before Jesus ever showed up. And so for Jesus to be given the title Savior and Lord, which obviously does have Old Testament background as well, is to make an authority claim that is in direct opposition to those who rule. So when Christians are instructed to honor the emperor, they are to honor them as human rulers and to offer them the obedience and submission that they are due, but not to relate to them as Lord and Savior. It is just wild to hear Christians talk about Jesus and, and uh, when he, he shows the disciples a coin and they say, you know, should we pay taxes? He says, well, whose image is on it? Right? Caesar. Well, render to Caesar what's Caesar and to God's what's God's. And a lot of people take that to mean do whatever the government tells you. But Jesus is actually making a very opposite statement in there. You see, Caesar's claim is that everything belongs to him. It all belongs to me. I have total authority. And that whatever I ask of you, you owe to me. And Jesus is doing several revolutionary things here. One, he's saying that not everything belongs to Caesar. There are things that belong to Caesar, and there are things that belong to God. Right away, he is limiting the authority of the ruling powers. And it's not something that they would agree with. And secondly, he is saying that God is the one who gets to determine those limits. The unbelieving state does not place limits on their authority. That's not how this works. History bears that out, and Scripture clearly tells us. Human beings do not limit their authority. They take, and they take, and they take, and they take. So we need to think through, not as a, not as a purely political thing, but as a matter of our worship, if the proclivity of the unbelieving state is to assume authority it does not possess and to require of us an obedience that we ought not to offer them, that is tantamount to an act of worship, then how do we live in these days? So that's what I'm trying to drive at here. I'm trying to transcend a, a tiny political conversation and to expand our minds and our thoughts to think biblically about this. Another text I'll read to you is Psalm 2. Psalm 2, you've probably read a lot over the last couple of years. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed this text is picked up by the disciples when they are trying to think through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. They're saying, surely there are gathered in this city rulers and authority against your anointed. They see the anointed being Jesus Christ and those who crucified him being the fulfillment of this actual text. Notice the, um, the attitude of the rulers. Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. The unbelieving rulers view the limits and restrictions and definitions of God and the world that he has made is inherently enslaving. And, and we're seeing this played out. I mean, you see this in the sexual revolution, right? That we don't want any definitions, any limits. We ought to have the freedom, the autonomy, the right and the authority to determine for ourselves what is real. It used to be, maybe 40, 50 years ago, we could determine for ourselves what we will do, you know? But now it's what is real. Such that even our physical makeup is not a justifiable limit. Our biology is not a restriction on who we are. Now it's my perception of who I am is who I am. Unbelief rages against limits and definitions. It rages against the authority of the one who has, the only one who has authority to give those definitions. Of course, we know the rest of the text that God is not thrown off by this assault against his authority, uh, but he is in heaven and he laughs and he welcomes those who rage against him. 
to repent and to find refuge in his son. The world is constantly engaged in a battle over authority. Um, I just want to read, I read this from the newspaper recently, and there was a pastor in, out in Alberta, and he got in a lot of trouble, and um, the judge just sentenced him. And this is from the National Post, uh, Raymond D'Souza. And uh, he mentions how the judge now requires this pastor, every time he is speaking related to current issues, he has to give a disclaimer. He has to literally say these words by law. I am also aware that the views I am expressing to you on this occasion may not be views held by the majority of medical experts in Alberta. While I may disagree with them, I am obliged to inform you that the majority of medical experts favor social distancing, mask wearing, avoiding large crowds to reduce the spread of COVID-19. D'Souza goes on to say, of course, the judge knows that forcing people to say what they do not wish to say and do not believe violates all the fundamental freedoms of the charter. It's what tyrants do. Courts, for that reason, do not compel rapists to apologize to their victims. <laughs> but you have to give a disclaimer about a viral, about a respiratory disease. Health bureaucrats, provincial cabinets, judges, officers of parliament, all are using the pandemic to expand their power. That is a very ancient infection to which state agents are prone. For that, even over the course of millennia, no effective vaccine has been developed. From the National Post. So this is the definition of statism. Statism is a political system in which the state uh, has substantial centralized control over social and economic affairs. It is an authority system. It is saying that we have the authority over these spheres of life. And those spheres begin, if, if, un, if, un, if not inhibited, every sphere of life. And this is the pattern of, this is the pattern of Scripture. This is the pattern of history. Um, we see this on a massive scale. Our culture having denied God's word as a standard, has also rejected definitions and limits imposed by any external authority. That means we have the authority, as I said, to define reality. But disregarding or denying God-ordained relationships does not absolve us of responsibilities. A man could have grown up in a broken home, and if he you know, if he chooses to walk out on his wife and kids, it doesn't mean that he ceases to be their father. It just means there's an empty seat at the table. There are responsibilities and obligations and duties that that man still bears, regardless of whether he accepts them, believes in them, whatever he feels about them, they are real. And the consequences of him either accepting them and embracing them and seeking God's grace to carry them or walking away from them will be felt. Because the world is a certain way, which is what I want to talk to you about. If we're going to think clearly about this, and the church has not thought clearly about this in the last couple of years, we need to step back. If the church is going to be faithful in its obedience to Jesus and know how to rightly relate to the governing authorities that he has placed over us, we need to step back a bit. We need to think more of on a, on a deeper foundational level. How do we think through our relationships to other people in this world? Not just the state, because that's the issue here. Who are you and what authority do you have over me? What I'm trying to teach our congregation is to think more in covenantal terms. I tell them reality is covenantal, and by that I mean this. Our world is defined by specific and particular relationships, and those relationships have specific and particular responsibilities that come with them and corresponding authority. This is something, this is the air that we used to breathe, you know, and this is how people used to think. They used to think covenantally, relationally. What are my duties and obligations to you, to, the, to God or to the gods, to the state, to my children, to my spouse, whatever that is. And then to conform ourselves to those. But now that we have rejected that altogether, there's so much confusion. But I want to restore this idea of a covenantal sense of reality. 
Our world is inescapably embedded with relational responsibilities and corresponding consequences, either blessings or curses and authority. These realities are what wet is to water. There's no such thing as water is not, that is not wet, and there's no moment of our existence that we do not bear specific responsibilities to God and to others. This is ultimately because God is triune, and he exists eternally in himself in relationship. That's what it means that he is love, the Father, Son, and Spirit, eternally existing. So these covenantal responsibilities are built into the very fabric of creation, which we see in Genesis 1 and 2. In Genesis 1, 28, God created man and woman in his image. Their very identity as image bearers of God has built in responsibilities to reflect him by worshiping him as priests in the garden temple. We see this in a variety of ways in Genesis 1 and 2. Um, The task to work and to keep, God placed man in the garden to work and to keep it, is the language used of priests in the tabernacle in Numbers 3, 7 to 8. Adam and Eve would offer their love to him as their gracious father. The language of image and likeness reflects sonship. We see this later in Genesis 5, 3, as Seth, the son of Adam, is in the image and likeness of Adam. And Adam, it says in Luke 3.38, is a son of God. They are to serve and to love one another. The covenant relationship is to be marked by steadfast love and faithfulness or faithful, loyal love. So God created Adam and Eve in a world and he created them with particular relational or covenantal obligations. Obligations to him as their creator and obligations to each other to love and to serve. The innate responsibility given to Adam and Eve is further demonstrated in the reality of both blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. Chapter 128 and chapter 217. Ultimately, the curse for disobedience is death, as Paul tells us in Romans 26. The point is this, a covenantal view of reality, which the Bible assumes and teaches, recognizes the particular relationships that God has built into creation and recognizes the unique responsibilities that exist and the corresponding authority that's given. Inversely, the nature of sin, thinking about this, is to deny responsibility and to distort authority. We see this in Adam and Eve. First, Adam abdicates his responsibility to protect his wife. Adam is present, but he abdicates. Then she is tempted to believe the serpent's lie that she won't face the consequences of disobedience, Genesis 3, 4. When God approaches Adam, rather than confessing his sin and failure, he hides and blames the woman, chapter 3, verse 12. Essentially, what's happening there because sometimes people might feel sympathetic for Adam, right? Well, God, that would be a terrifying thing to come face to face with your creator. But what Adam is doing is so insidiously selfish because Adam was told, the day you eat of it, you shall die. And so when he says the woman made me do it, he is actually saying, I would rather her die than me. It's a total inverse of the servant relationship and the nature of love that he is supposed to have with his wife, one of sacrifice, service. It's self-protection. It's the opposite of love. So covenant, a covenant view of reality recognizes there are particular relationships embedded into creation that we must walk in accordance with. Another principle we see in the Bible is that authority is always tied to and limited to responsibility. That is, one does not possess authority over people and matters for which they are not responsible. This is massively important. This is just a basic principle of existence that a lot of people don't understand. Authority in Scripture always corresponds to responsibility. 
always corresponds to responsibility. When you have authority with no responsibility, you have a tyranny. And when you have responsibility with no authority to carry that out, you have impotence. In an ordered world and in Scripture, that we are given particular responsibilities defined by God's word, husbands to wives, parents to children, subjects to state, members to elders, elders to congregations, neighbors to each other, all of these relationships have unique responsibilities and authority that corresponds to that. So, for example, one of the reasons um, we're doing a membership class, and one of the things we always... Membership is something that, at least in Peterborough, um, a lot of people think about it in purely formal terms, right? Like, uh, my name's on a list, and what does that really mean? So we say functional church membership. And by that, we mean knowing your responsibilities to each other as brothers and sisters, to your leaders, and them to you. So in Hebrews, we see that we are to be um, obey our leaders, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. And what I tell my people is, um, in one sense, we see that there is a real and meaningful authority tied to the elders. But that authority is tied to their responsibility over a particular people. I'm not the Peterborough pastor, right? I'm not the West End pastor. I have been given a particular responsibilities. That's what he said. That's what he means by those who will give an account. I will stand before God. I will give an account for a particular people at a particular place, at a particular time. And church membership helps me to define that relationship. Because you can't even say, well, it's all the people in this building. What if someone shows up for two weeks? Is God going to judge me for the way that I shepherd their souls? I don't even know their names. So how do we figure this out? Well, we need to develop a covenant we need to define the relationship, and historically churches have done that through membership, which is to say, I am responsible to my brothers and sisters in this way, I am responsible to my leaders in this way, they are responsible to me this way, and the authority corresponds to that. Same with husbands and wives. A husband is the head of his home, head of his wife. He is not the head of wives. Right? And the father is the father of his children. He bears responsibility for the instruction and the discipline of his children, not all children. And he has a corresponding authority to do that. Mothers over their children, same kind of thing. It's interesting, though, when we come to the state, people throw all that out the window. Christ ultimately, is given all authority, Philippians 2, 5 to 11, because he has taken all responsibility upon himself. Christ is exalted to the right hand of God because he has suffered and died. That he is the obedient son who fulfilled all of the duties, responsibilities, obligations that Adam had, not only to Eve, but as the head over all of humanity and to his God. And therefore, because he has taken full responsibility, not only in doing what Adam ought to have done, but dying in the place of Adam and all of his race for all of their failures to do those things, which is why Jesus is the last Adam. Because he bore full responsibility and therefore he has been given all authority. Authoritarianism occurs when authority is not expressed within its God-ordained limits. And this happens in three ways. We wrongfully assume authority we don't possess. So when a father assumes authority over another man's children, a husband assuming authority over another man's wife, a pastor assuming authority over another church's members, that's a distortion of God-ordained authority because they are not responsible the other way we can distort God ordained authority is when we wrongly ascribe authority to others they do not possess. We see this, that's what we just read about in Revelation 13. The claims of the ruling powers making authority claims that they don't actually have. And almost everyone on the earth submits to those. So when we assume authority we don't possess, when we ascribe it, and when we wrongfully abdicate 
authority God has given us the responsibility to exercise. So this is, happens when parents don't take the responsibility to discipline and instruct their children in the Lord. When we either abdicate, when we assume that which is not ours, or when we ascribe it to somebody else, this is how we distort authority. The faithful Christian life then recognizes the various covenant relationships that God has built into creation, including their particular responsibilities and authority, and seeks to live faithfully in them. The last thing I'll say, and we'll open up to a conversation soon, is, um, well, I'll say two things. One, it's interesting that most Christians don't have a problem and in fact would acknowledge that we need to define the family according to Scripture. We need to define the responsibilities of husbands, the responsibilities of wives, the responsibilities of parents, the duties of children. Almost all Christians, if you ask them what they think about the family and what people's responsibilities are and their authority, they'll go to the Bible. Well, well God tells us that children are to honor their parents. Parents are to discipline and instruct their children. The husbands are to love their wives. The wives are to respect their husbands. And we pick out our text. Even when we think through economic relationships, you know, how employees and employers relate to one another. When we think about churches and membership and church polity, who are pastors, who are elders, what are their duties, what is their authority, what is a church member, what is their responsibility, what is their authority, we go to the scriptures to determine those things. When we think through how to love our wife. But it's funny that when, the, um, when it comes to the state, Christians all of a sudden feel that it is out of line for God to define the nature of the state. But do you see how that is actually buying into a worldly and an idolatrous view of the state? That is to say that the state possesses authority to define itself. Families don't. Individuals don't. Christians will say, well, if you think you're a man and you're a biological woman, you're just not. And the Bible says so. Neighbors don't. But the one group that has the authority to define its responsibilities and its authority, which is limitless, is the state. This is, this is just idolatry. It's just idolatry. Your, your unbelieving neighbor, if he doesn't believe in God and he's a... He's a, he's a hard atheist, and he tells you that he's walking in on his wife and kids. No Christian says, well, I mean, he doesn't even believe in dads. He doesn't, he doesn't believe in marriage. So I guess he doesn't have the responsibility. No one says that. Well, he doesn't believe the Bible, so he has the right to determine for himself how we will live. No one will say that if someone walks out on their spouse. No one will say that if a child is disrespectful to parents. No one will say that. But when it comes to the state, so many people will say that. They'll say, well, our government doesn't even believe in God. And you don't believe in theonomy, do you? Well, God is the creator of all, and he defines and he limits all relationships he defines the state and its responsibilities and its corresponding authority. <clears throat> Statism requires three things. The abdication of responsibilities and authority God has assigned to families, churches, and individuals. So for statism to exist, there needs to be a dysfunction in the relationship on the part of the subjects and the state. So one thing that needs to happen is the subjects need to abdicate their responsibilities and surrender their God-given authority and to say, we're going to give this to you. There, I don't know if you remember that in the, I think it was Peel region, the health unit came out <laughs> during this time and they walked it back because there's so much outrage. But they were telling parents they had to put like two and three-year-olds in their bedroom by themselves using different bathrooms, not eating with them. There were moms on social media being like, it's so sad, my baby's crying all night, but I just can't go to them. It was, it was like, yesterday that would be abuse, literally, by law. That would be abuse and neglect, and CAS comes in and takes your kids. 
if you lock them in a room by themselves, refuse to eat with them, isolate them completely for two weeks. <laughs> and then there was so much outrage, rightly so, that they kind of walked that back. Like, yeah, that came across as full-blown totalitarian. Like, yeah. But what had to happen is that parent had to say, you know what? It's actually their job to raise my kid. My child's health belongs entirely to their care. And they have the rightful authority to tell me what room my kid is in. Or churches. Well, the state has an interest in public welfare, whatever that is. And therefore, we must submit to them, even if we don't want to. So you must abdicate your responsibilities and authority that God gives you. Secondly, you must ascribe those responsibilities and that authority to the state. So you give up yours, you give it to them. You abdicate, you ascribe, and lastly, on the part of the state, is the assumption of responsibilities and authorities that they do not possess. Scripture tells us very plainly, Revelation 13 is a good example, but even the, the nature of sin in Genesis 1-3 to is that humans will always assume authority they do not possess. That's the nature of sin. Statism requires the abdication of responsibilities and authorities, the ascribing of responsibility and authorities, and the assumption of responsibilities and authorities on the part of the state. All of these are an act of idolatry and disobedience. To submit to the unbiblical authority claims of the unbelieving state is itself idolatrous. This is why it matters. It's not just because when you put your kid in their room for two weeks, it harms them. It does. It does harm them. But it's also a matter of your obedience. Who gets to tell you what a, what a parent is? Who gets to tell you what a mom's job is? Who gets to tell you what a dad's job is? Who gets to tell you what a child's duty is? Who gets to tell you what a man is, what a woman is? Who gets to tell you what a church is? Who gets to tell you who your neighbor is? Who gets to tell you what the state is? And the answer for all of those is God. Now, does this open up many questions about how a state functions and all this stuff? Absolutely. But what we need to get rock solid, that there could be no ambiguity on this, is that God determines the limits and the definitions of every relationship in this world, including the relationships of civilians to the state, of churches to the state, of families to state, of families to each other. All of these things God defines. Statism is the rejection of that entirely. And to say, no, the state determines. And when that happens, the state doesn't just determine the nature of the state. The state, tells, the state tells you the nature of your family. The state tells you the nature of your church. See, this is what happened when they said the churches weren't essential. That is a, that is a claim about the nature of the church. When you leave Costco open and not churches, they are making a statement about the nature and the definition of a church. They're saying that is more important than this or more essential than this. They'll do it with families, they'll do it with individuals. The state takes on a God-like role. Um, I'm going to stop it there and maybe open up for some questions. We have about 10 or 15 minutes left. Um, maybe this just opened a can of worms for us, but we do need to be thinking about these things. And a lot of Christians have thought about these things. Uh, the history of the church there's some good stuff to read on this, but even throughout the world, I mean, all of our brothers and sisters in um, China, and we have lots of brothers and sisters in former communist countries, and the church, praise be to God, is well situated to thrive in such environments. As we see in the book of Revelation, um, the churches that, that, John, that Jesus commends through John are actually the ones who suffer. They're the only ones that he doesn't rebuke. It's the church that is materially prosperous, the church that thinks it's very orthodox. All these churches he rebukes, but the ones that are suffering the most, he actually just commends. 
So I don't want you to be discouraged and think, you know, how can we be a faithful church in a world that assumes authority it doesn't possess? It's like, well, the church of Jesus Christ living under his rule and reign is in a perfect position. And the church can thrive in these times. But what it might look like conquering in Revelation 3 looks like enduring suffering. And that's what we need to prepare for. So are there, are there questions, questions that people have? Comments, concerns, stones? Yeah. Um, first of all, if you could repeat the question so the folks that are live streaming. Sure, yes. Um, where, where does a Christian determine where the lines are drawn? Because like we obey speed limits during the war, you know, people locked out their houses because the government's told them to. Um, where are those limits drawn? Yeah, so there's three categories for that in the scriptures. Babe, repeat the question. Oh, where are the limits drawn for our obedience to, say, the state? And this is, these are principles that could be true of any authority. So not just the state. It could be your spouse. It could be uh, your parents. It could be your pastors. It could be your employers. How do we... Um, think through our duties to those in legitimate authority over us. And the three categories that scripture has, we see these uh, play out several places, the book of Acts, um, is that we must obey God rather than man. And so what that means is wherever someone requires of us that which God forbids, we must, we must reject it. Or where someone forbids that which God requires, we must obey God rather than man. So those two categories are fairly plain, right? When they're brought before the council and told not to preach uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, they you know, respectfully, we're going to obey God rather than man. And they go on preaching. And because God, because Jesus has commissioned them to that task. The third category that people aren't to that is basically related to everything I just taught, is that someone does not actually possess authority unless it is granted to them by God. So, for example, um, it's not just whether God forbids something or God requires something, but has he actually granted that authority? This is the third category that most people just totally overlook. And there's no obligation whatsoever to submit to authority that isn't legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's, that's what I would say. And this is a big paradigm shift for people. So I, I think to make a, maybe think through this practically, we really need to think through the nature of the state and its duties. I mean, Romans 13 says to punish evil and reward good. Uh, that is not exclusive and absolute authority over all issues pertaining to public safety. Uh, exegetically, there's zero warrant for that. Mm -hmm. If you just take the phrase good, yeah. Would you think our businesses should obey health and safety regulations? Like, should, you know, if the health and safety inspector sitting out of the rail, should we tell them to go pound salt or should we obey, you know, like, because are we entitled to safety or is safety? Yes. Yes. That's a great question. So the question was, um, what is our obligation to, you know, state safety requirements? So I'll get to that. I'm, the, where I'm going with this, we'll get to that. Public safety is a very vacuous term. Okay. It's a very. It's a very. What does that even mean? And there's several problems with one. One, exegetically, there's no warrant to say that the government has exclusive and ultimate authority over public safety. The Bible doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. That's an inference that people draw, probably from whatever, whatever the good is. So they, the government in Romans 13 is given the authority of the sword. They have coercive authority. Which is why in our church, if you commit a crime, we won't hold a, a trial and, and put you in the basement for five years. Uh, we don't have the authority to do that. We will hand you over to police, and they will deal with that. Um, but the problem with public safety 
as a, as, a, as a junk drawer term, is that what are the limits on that? So just to give a practical example, the, um, is it Bill C-6, basically the censorship bill, the online censorship, no, it's not C-6, it's... Ten. C-10? Something. Anyways, it's the online censorship bill, but the language that they use for speech is harm and public safety. In other words, the reason we need to control what you say is a matter of public safety. But if we surrender the principle that the state has ultimate and exclusive authority over matters of public safety, they believe that your speech is a matter of public safety. They need to protect people from you. Words are harm. On what grounds do you resist that? If you've already said public safety belongs to them. The reality is, biblically, public safety encompasses all of life. All of life. Literally everything I do, including being here right now, some way impacted the safety of other people. Whether through, you know, people being here and not doing other things they could be doing, or positively doing things. That there's almost no way to separate anything we do from having some kind of either great or small impact on the well-being of others. And if we say that the state or the church or the home has exclusive authority over issues of public safety, that is literally to say they have authority over all of life. All of life. Because there's nothing that can't be tied to the well-being of people. Nothing. So we need to reject that outright. So when I saw pastors start saying that, I just thought, what are you going to do when climate change means your church can't have more than 20 people because of your carbon footprint? On what grounds will you say no? Because it's clearly an existential safety problem, and you just said that they have the exclusive authority. That's their jurisdiction. So we say, no, 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 wait a second. Public safety is the duty of individuals making decisions, is the duty of parents and their children, is the duty of the state, as an interest in that, is the duty of churches, caring for people's spiritual well-being and doing good to one another in the household of God. Public safety is literally like all of life, and it involves all of the spheres and relationships that God has ordained, working together and thinking through what's your responsibility, what's my responsibility, in order to actually keep people safe. So it's not just one. To answer your question of does the state have any authority, um, we do see in the Old Covenant like parapet laws, right? So there's a moral responsibility of citizens in Israel to make sure that their own private property uh, was safe for people. It was a way that they expressed love for their neighbor. So I think that I think that Christians, you know, do have a duty if you're inviting uh, somebody who's unstable over your house, don't make them walk across an ice rink to get to your front step. Um, and, act, and if you knowingly neglect to do that and they get hurt, I would say you bear culpability of that. What is the role of the state in that? It's tricky to make the direct correlation because obviously um, the Old Covenant is built on a, 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 a civil structure as well. It's inseparable. You can't just pick out one thing and take it because we don't live in the same civic structure anymore. I would say um, the third category of just because you don't have a duty to submit to someone doesn't mean you can't. So there are laws surrounding, uh, surrounding uh, you know, safety, public safety, that we might think are ridiculous. And that if, it, if push, push came to shove and it somehow required us to be disobedient, like I would say if they said, for some reason, because of climate change, it's not safe for people to be in this room more than 10% capacity. It's kind of the building code. If that came into the building codes, I would say that Christians have a duty to reject that because they have an obligation to gather together people of God. But if they put certain safety things in place, like slaves obeying your masters, um, and I think that it's not wrong. What I'm not saying is it is wrong for a Christian to offer obedience that they're not actually required to. You can do that. 
So you can say, as long as I'm not disobeying God in other areas of my life, as long as I'm not neglecting things that God requires, or I'm not doing something that God forbids, I actually am free. I'm, not, I'm a slave of no one, but then I can be a slave of everyone kind of thing. Like, I'm, I'm free to do this. But it's on different grounds. So I wouldn't go say, you know, pound sand. Could you briefly speak to how we may feel yeah. to separate our Christianity and how we're responsible to the Lord with anger? Yeah. Like, there's some of the stuff that physically angers us. Yeah. And, and how do we balance those two? Something that doesn't make sense does anger us when we yeah. hear it. Repeat the question. Oh, so basically, how do we um, how do we deal with anger, you know, towards say injustice or irrationality? Um, as a Christian. As a Christian. Pardon? As a Christian. As Christians. Why have you been angry before? <laughs> <laughs> no, something else. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've struggled with this. I mean, I've I've never felt uh, so. I have not felt so pervasively frustrated and angry uh, as I have in the last year and a half. It's, it's, uh, it has been more part of my life than it probably ever has, sadly. Um, you know, the anger of man does not bring about the righteousness of God. And I think part of what we need to do, part of what I hope this produces in us is a, uh, we need to realize that this is the pattern of the world. And when you realize that the pattern of the world is to um, is irrationality and incoherence and um, the wrongful assumption of authority and the abuse of authority, once you kind of get over the fact that that is the way that it is, then you can start thinking about, okay, now how do I relate to these people? How do I love these people? But I know for me, it was a lot harder, say, in the spring and summertime last year when I was... I was not coming to grips with the fact that this is how it is. It was like, I did not want to come to terms with that. And it was making me very frustrated. And I thought, we'll just get to the courts, or this will just lift, or this will just change. And now it's like, okay, I need to think biblically about this. Okay, this is the world that we live in. And, uh, you know, how do we respond? And the biggest thing, that's why I preached on last night, it's like your vision of Jesus. It's like, if, if your hope was in a stable government, and if your hope was that you would just be left alone, and if your hope was that the state wouldn't make any authority claims over your life, the life of you and your family, that you'd be left in peace, I mean, that is a, that hope is just shattered. And we can either fall into despair and discouragement, anger or bitterness, or we can live by faith that says, you know what, that's what my Bible says the world's going to be like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't, to feel anger towards the, where we're headed. Uh, yeah. Scripture tells us where we're headed. That, that's, I'm, pe I'm peace with that. I think what it, the anger is about individual things. In yeah. other words, a fireman or a hydro guy goes into a hole and tests for oxygen. This is just an example. And he can't go into the hole under artificial law unless it's 19 and a half you put the same meter under a mask and it fires right away. Right. But everybody's forced to wear them. Yeah. Things like that make me angry because they make absolutely no sense. Yeah. And people can't see that. That's where the anger comes. Not from where society is. Yeah. Um, maybe one thing I'd add to that is, well, it's good to be aware of that, right? It's good to be cognizant of that yourself. One thing we need to think through as well um, that I can't really get into this morning is that we need to really get a solid grounding in individual conscience. And this is something the church has just whiffed in the last year. And it's, it's actually whoever leads one of these little ones into sin, you know, a millstone should be tied around their neck. Um, and whatever's not done from faith is sin. When you require people to do something that their conscience feels is wrong for them to do, and you demand it of them, and they do it not as an act of faith, but it under threat and coercion, you lead them into sin. Uh, and many churches have done that. Um, 
I don't think it's good for Christians to lose their sense of morality, the sense of reality, you know, of, um, we were just saying last night, I mean, uh, my father died this past year, and, and uh, when I went in to see him in long-term care, I, uh, I, su- I, I had this moment where I went in to go see him, and they made me put on a gown, gloves, goggles, and a mask, and, and I just thought I was totally fine with it, because I just wanted to see my dad. Long-term care is very susceptible. They're actually the at-risk people. Um, and my conscience was, was fine. We went out somewhere two nights ago that we thought, that we were told was going to be a folding exemption. And we walk in, it's almost empty. Big restaurant. Eight people. Three of them right here, four of them right there. You know, maybe it's a little bit more. Two, two right here and one there. Literally within ten feet of me. No masks, right, because they're sitting at their tables. And for some reason, the server came up. She said, oh, you need to wear a mask. And like our table is about eight feet, like right there. And it was so uncomfortable. Like it was almost cringily awkward because I just thought literally no one in this building is wearing one. Like we're all looking at them. We're all, and they're all looking at us. But I have to wear it to go eight feet. And we, we left because my conscience just wouldn't allow me to do that. Like I'll, I'll do it under certain conditions, but it's just, when I have to say a lie, I can't do it. And so I would say, related to your anger comment, you, we need to control our anger, and we need to ask God for grace and deal with it in the appropriate ways, but we also need to not sear our conscience. Mm-hmm. And so, when you're told to do something irrational or, or you know, self-contradictory, and you feel pricked about that, such that it's tantamount to you lying, you need to be aware of that. Because uh, if you give into that in the little things, you'll give into it in the big things. So, yes? It's not really a question, maybe just more of a comment on yeah. how we, we see the church seems to have lost its willingness to, to stand up at a time like this. I think back to, say, I'm guessing 20 years ago, when the government made it illegal Yeah. I think probably most Christians today still spank their children when it's necessary. Mm-hmm. And other situations where maybe 30 years ago the government made it legal to open businesses on Sunday, Sunday shopping. Yeah. And how people stood up to those things and you know, we started coalitions to fight the government, petition the government. And maybe the last thing I'll, I'll say, and we can pray, is that um, love requires us to know our duties towards others and our authority and to respect that in others. It's a really tragic thing that under the guise of loving our neighbor, so many Christians have given into a, a form of statism. Mm-hmm. Because if, I mean, this, this way of relating to people in the world is only, only wreaks havoc and ruin. Like, it's, it's one of the most clear things we can... Like, you, we have people alive today who the last century saw 100 million people under this kind of relationship to the state die mm-hmm. at the hands of their own state. And not just death. We're not talking about the consequence, the destruction of the family unit and churches and this type of thing. It's, it's, it's actually not loving to surrender a God-given responsibilities to the state at all. Uh, it's one of the most unloving things you can do. That doesn't, there's appropriate ways to, to resist and stuff, but it's, it's like, this is not going to lead to human flourishing. Mm-hmm. This is, we're sitting here, but like, what about our neighbors? You, you look at the people coming into the public schools in 10 years. I, I saw a mom walking her kid down the sidewalk with a mask and a rainbow flag, and I just, I actually just felt sad for that kid. Like, what is a seven-year-old doing outside with a, like, this is just gross state indoctrination so it's not a matter of just our rights that's not what this is about at all it's about the worship of jesus 
and it is about the good of other people. And we need to think carefully about these things. Move forward. I'm going to wrap it up with some prayer. This probably opens a lot of conversation we could have. I'll be willing to talk to you after. You can send all your angry emails to Josh. <laughs> He'll send them to Harry, so. Uh, but let, let me just pray for us, okay? Our Father in heaven, we come to you in Jesus' name. We confess that he has died and risen, that he has ascended to your right hand, and he has been given all rule and authority and dominion. We confess that as creator, you have designed this world in a certain way that you have embedded into it a series of particular relationships that are defined by responsibilities and authority, and that we worship you, we walk in obedience when we recognize and submit ourselves to your word, to the world as you define it, to authority as you limit it. Father, we admit that these are confusing times and that the message of the world is in conflict with the message of your word. And we pray that you would give us the courage of conviction to truly stand on the authority of scripture, that that wouldn't just be a doctrinal check mark but that that would be something that we live and die by. Who gets to define reality? Lord, we thank you that you are not only creator, but redeemer, that you sent your son into this world to rescue us from sin, from our idolatry, from our abdication, from the wrongful assumption and the wrongful ascribing of authority. You have come to reorder this world through the raising of your son, by presenting him as preeminent. So God, I pray that you would help us, help Trinity, help Hill City to live faithfully in your word in a time when so many reject it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.